Happy Father's Day. Think about a time, a time where you have a good memory of working with your dad. A memory of working with your dad. Here's my story. I'm 16 years old. And so I ask my dad for a car. Now, I don't really think my dad's going to buy me a car. I didn't think so. But he did. In fact, he bought me two cars. And neither one ran. One, the engine was blown. It was great in every other way, but the engine was shot. The other one had a solid engine, but everything else was falling apart. And so my dad offers to spend the summer switching the engines in these cars with me. That was an amazing summer. I learned so much about my dad during that summer. So some of it felt like this. Everybody say, aww. Sometimes, sometimes stuff broke and bolts wouldn't turn and you're covered in, you're bleeding and you're covered in grease from head to toe and then it felt kind of like this. <laughs> yeah. And at the end of pretty much every day, it felt like this. So all summer long, we work on these cars we swap the engines out, and at the end of the summer, the car runs. I am on top of the world. That first week I'm driving around town, I can remember vividly exactly what it felt like. I was so, so happy. Now the summer's over, and I take the car on my first road trip. I'm heading back to my mom's house. I drive up a hill on the, way out, uh, on the way out of town, I drive up a hill. The engine heats up to about a thousand degrees. Oil starts shooting everywhere. There is oil shooting out the front grill of the vehicle, out of the engine, out of the hood, there's oil shooting. And I watch as my engine destroys itself. What do I feel like in that moment? I feel just... <laughs> yes. Uh, actually, even worse, I felt just like my engine, completely destroyed. I'm thinking to myself, I asked my dad for a car. I spend the whole summer doing crazy hard work, and I end up with absolutely nothing to show for. At least, that's what I thought. We'll come back to it. We're in a series of messages right now called Discovering Prayer. Discovering Prayer. And last time, we really focused hard on the fact that prayer changes the outcome. When we pray, well, there's right ways to pray and wrong ways to pray. But when we pray in the way that God teaches us, things change. That doesn't mean that we get every single thing we want. No, no, no. That would be a horrific nightmare if we got everything that we wanted. But it means that God wants to give us good things. And many, many times we are given what we ask for. And even when we're not, we're given what we need. Often far better than what we ask for when we seek God in prayer. So our main point from last time was that prayer works because God cares. And you can write this down. It's in your notes again for today. Prayer works because God cares. And we said, try it. And we said, live it. Try it and live it. Each week we're having a prayer experiment that you are encouraged to try out. And the prayer experiment for last week was really simple. It was just this. Pray more. So if you're at zero, maybe you don't pray at all, maybe you've never really tried this out, well, give it a try. Not just once, not just a quick little shot to God, but really give it a try, praying for something and seeking God until he answers you. 
if you've been praying, you know that prayer works, but you're not seeing a lot of answers to prayer right now in your life, find some way, this was our challenge, our experiment last week, find some way to increase the level of prayer in your life. So I did that this week. I'm sure most of you did that as well. And I have seen all kinds of prayers being answered. The funny thing about that is many of them are in really surprising ways that I wouldn't have expected. But I, the things that I did this week to increase prayer, I added sort of a midday prayer time into my schedule, and I did that almost every day this week. And I also made sure, I have a lot of meetings throughout the week, and I made sure that we actually included prayer. We always include prayer, but I made sure that we, it was a priority in those meetings. Not just the thing we do at the very end, oh yeah, we got to pray before we go, but that it's a priority and we give it time in those meetings. Those are the things I did, and I can tell you, I'll share more stories as we go through this series, but I can tell you lots of answers. I can see God working all around me as I do that. So prayer works because God cares. Try it, live it. Today, we're focusing on the Father heart of prayer. It's Father's Day. We're going to talk, uh, talk about some things that are close to Dad's hearts. We're going to do this in three sections. First, we're going to talk about getting stuff done. Dads love to get stuff done. At least I do. Any other dads out there want to give me a grunt of assent? Yeah, get stuff done. We're going to talk about how can we get stuff done. And then we're going to talk about some teaching from Jesus on how we can pray the right way. How we can live a life of prayer where our prayers are actually answered. And then we're going to talk about why they're answered. We're going to talk about God's heart and how God is like a father to us. And we'll wrap up with another prayer experiment for the week that you can try out. All right, so first, let's jump into getting stuff done. Now, sometimes prayer gets pushed to the back burner because we feel like we're too busy. Have you ever felt like that? Like there's just too much going on in your life. There's too many things you need to accomplish. And so you have to spend your time doing the things that need to get done. You can't go off and just be alone in your room for 20 minutes or an hour or take time out because you got to get stuff done. I want to take you to a passage in the book of Colossians. This is found in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Let's pull that up on the screen. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm going to read it just off the screen here. I want us to think very carefully. We're going to look at verse 12 and verse 13. And this is written by the Apostle Paul, who was one of the earliest followers of Jesus and a leader in the church. And he's going to teach us something about prayer. Paul accomplished huge things in this life through the help of God, through prayer. Here's what he says. Epaphras, this is a guy that he knew. Epaphras is somebody's name. You could just think John, okay? Bob. Bob, who is one of you, <laughs> and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends his greetings. This is the end of a letter that Paul was writing. Bob is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. So the first thing we notice here. Bob is described as wrestling in prayer for the people that the letter was written to. This letter was written to a couple of different churches that were far away from where Paul was living at the time, where he was writing the letter from. Now this is interesting, isn't it? Wrestling in prayer. How many of you, don't raise your hand, would think of your time spent in prayer as a wrestling match? That maybe is a new way of thinking about prayer. Then let's look at the next verse. Pull up Colossians 4.13. So this comes immediately after. And Paul says, I vouch for him, I vouch for Bob, that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. I know, weird names. They're just cities that are in that same region. So he's writing to the people, he's writing to the people in Newton, and he's saying, this guy Bob is working hard for you guys in Newton and for the people in North Delta and for the people in Guilford. 
He's working hard for you. Now that's really interesting. Because the question is, how could Bob or Epaphras have been working hard for these people at the time he was hundreds, hundreds of miles away from them? You don't have internet or telephones or computers. In what way is Bob or Epaphras working hard for these people? And the answer is what we saw in the previous verse. Paul is saying, that this man, Epaphras, is working hard for the people of this church in prayer. That's the work that he's doing for them. And actually, that prayer looks like a wrestling match. Bob is struggling so hard, so disciplined, so diligently in prayer for these people. Now, you notice when Paul describes this at wor as work, we can see that he is thinking of prayer as actually the way, or a primary way, that we get things done. So Paul thought of this in a totally different way than many of us. We get mixed up and we think, if I have so much to do, actually I can't stop and pray. Because I got too much to do, I gotta, I gotta work to accomplish it. And Paul, the Bible is telling us here, prayer in fact, is the work. Prayer, in fact, is the way that we get stuff done. It's not the only way. We also need to work, and we're going to look at that in a minute. But prayer is the way that we get stuff done. And that is the second point that you can write down in your notes this morning. Prayer is how we get stuff done. That is very important. It's like a secret to life. A secret to life that the Bible has been holding out there publicly for thousands of years, but still we don't know it. God is speaking to you today and saying this, you need to get stuff done. The way to get stuff done is through prayer. What could be more effective? Sometimes when you have something that you need to get done and it's too much for you to accomplish or you don't have the skills and ability to accomplish it, what do you do? You ask someone for help. Well, if you're a dad, you probably don't. If you're anything like me, you don't ask anyone for help, but you should. You ask someone to come and help you. What could be more effective than asking the God of the universe who made everything? He can get so much stuff done that he could create the whole universe in six days. That's the kind of getting stuff done he can do. What could be more effective than asking him for help? So dads, today, this morning, you want to get stuff done? The place we start is in prayer. Let's move into our next section. We're going to look at two pieces of teaching that come one right after the other from Jesus himself. These pieces of teaching are found in Matthew chapter 7 in a very famous uh, sermon or message that Jesus gave called the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Mountain. So if you have a Bible or you want to follow along the screen, let's turn to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to start at verse 7. Let's see what Jesus has. And here he's talking about prayer, although he does not use the word prayer in this section. Here's what he says. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Because everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Ask, seek, knock. And this is, for us today, the core of what we're trying to get across in this message, the teaching of Jesus. How do we pray? What does effective prayer work like? Uh, eff effective prayer look like, rather. Not work like. It is work. What does effective prayer look like? If you want to pray in a way that actually gets stuff done, 
where you see answers to prayer regularly, not everything you want all the time. That's never going to happen. But answers to prayer continually in your life. What does that kind of prayer look like? And here Jesus tells us exactly what it looks like. Asking, seeking, and knocking. So let's talk about that for a minute. On one level, Jesus is just reiterating himself. He's saying the same thing over and over again, which is something that he did often because we need to hear the same thing over and over again, don't we? We hear something, we think, oh, that's amazing and that's true, and then we don't do it. So we have to hear it again and again. And Jesus is saying it in different ways as well. If you want help from God, you have to ask him. A lot of Jesus' teachings are astonishingly simple. You have to ask for help. That's how it works. If you want help from God, you have to seek him. It's not just asking, but seeking him for that help. If you want help from God, you got to go knock on his door and ask him, ask him to open up the door so that you can go in. But we see here also, Jesus is not just repeating himself, but showing us more and more of what the asking needs to look like ask. Yes, but that asking is not just reciting a list to God. Some of you have tried prayer maybe many times, and some of the time your prayer feels like you're just reading off a list to God. God, can you please help my, my Aunt Tilly? She's got this problem. God, can you please give more money for this because there's not enough money? God, can you please help me with my math test? And your prayer becomes... It starts to feel like you're just reading a list to God. You're asking, but here Jesus, when he says seek, he starts to go deeper. It's not just asking. Your prayer needs to look like you are seeking God for help. Seeking him. And that is a much stronger word than asking. If you're seeking, you're looking around for things everywhere. You're, you're trying, if something doesn't work, you try a different method or you look somewhere else, you're pushing through to get to the other side. It's not just a simple ask and I'm done, but it's seeking God in prayer. And then knocking even goes a step further. You've got to knock so that the door can be open. Here's an illustration we could use to think about this. Many of you have had this experience where you, maybe as a volunteer when you were a kid, or maybe even as an adult, as a, as a job, you did door-to-door -door sales. How many of you have been in door-to-door -door sales? Yeah, or even done that once. And how many of you love it? Yeah, no, nobody loves, maybe some people do, I don't know. If you love door-to-door -door sales, come talk to me, because that's weird. We gotta work it out. Door-to-door -door sales. Now imagine you're a kid and you're selling, I don't know what you're selling, you know, girl guide cookies or you're selling chocolate bars for your school. You've got in your mind that prize bicycle that they're going to give you if you sell 10,000 chocolate bars. You've got it planned out. Everybody in your neighborhood is going to buy 100. You're going to have this done by the end of the day. You go to the first house. Your mom lets you out of the car because parents are helicopter parents nowadays. And you go up to the front door and you go to ring the doorbell and you're terrified. And so you think, well, maybe I'll knock instead. And you, you give this little knock. Knock, knock, knock. Knock, knock, knock. And you let one second go by, and then you say, oh, they're not home. Boom! Did you sell any candy bars? No, you didn't. This is the illustration that Jesus is using here. He's trying to bring in experiences from real life our regular life to show us what we need to be like in prayer. The way to sell those candy bars or girl guide cookies is that you walk up to the door, you ring the doorbell, you knock very loudly. You wait five seconds, you knock again. You listen and see if they're coming out of the shower or whatever they're doing. You knock again with persistence. They finally open the door. You smile. Hi, I'm a little kid or I'm your new best friend. And you boldly, you boldly tell them this great thing that you have and ask them to please purchase this from you. You're telling them why. That's how you sell things. 
Now, Jesus is not here telling us to be salespeople in prayer. Don't get me wrong. You see, prayer is actually a little bit different. Take the analogy one step further. You're at that door and you're tempted to be really timid. If you want to sell the chocolate bars, you need to be really bold knocking on that door. Take the analogy one step further. What if the house that you're knocking on the door, what if that house belongs to your dad? What if you know that inside that house isn't some stranger, but it's actually your own father who loves you, who provides for you, who is proud of you, who wants to see you succeed? In that case, if it was your dad who was inside and it was something you really needed and you knocked on that door and no one answered at first, would you just walk away? What if it's your own house and it's the place where you live because it's your father's house? And the door was locked and you couldn't get in, but that's the place where you live. Would you just leave? No, you would do everything you could possibly do to get in that house, wouldn't you? If you knocked on the door five times and rang the doorbell and your parents didn't answer because they were in the shower or they were sleeping, you wouldn't just go away and sleep on the street. You would find a way in through a window. You would throw stuff at their bedroom window. You would get out the ladder. You would, I don't know, all the different things. You would call them on their cell phone. You would, if, if worse came to worse, you would go get the authorities and try to have the police help you get in this house. You would never give up because it's your father's house. It's where you belong. This is where Jesus is about to go in the next verses. He is telling us he is telling us that we need to ask in a whole different way than we've thought of when we just have a list of things to pray for. We need to ask and we need to keep on asking. We need to seek, we need to keep on seeking, and we need to knock until the door is opened. So the next point in your notes today is this. A life of prayer means asking, seeking, and knocking. That's what an effective life, a real life of prayer, that's what it looks like. That's what it takes. This ask, seek, and knock is also a powerful uh, illustration of what it looks like sometimes when we pray. You see, sometimes we ask for something, and then we look for what God is doing in the world, we think we see an answer. God is starting to answer my prayer in a certain way, but then obstacles pop up. Have you ever had that happen? You asked for God for something in prayer. It looked like it was going to happen. It looked like there was an answer, some door that you could walk through, but then all of a sudden there was another obstacle in your way. You need to keep going through that, knocking on the door and pushing through the obstacles that come. Jesus is also here giving us, giving us an illustration of what our prayer life needs to look like when the problems come in. Again, back to my dad and the car. Uh, it's just like when you're repairing something. You're fixing that car. You're working on your house. You're doing some project, dads. Isn't there always something that goes wrong? You make a plan. You think it's going to go a certain way. It's going to take me one hour to do this job. And then 47 things go wrong in the middle of the project. You're tempted to get really mad and get out the sledgehammer, aren't you? But in that kind of work, you need to push through all of those things. That's one of the things I learned from my dad that summer, is that when you're doing a project, when you're doing this work, obstacles will arise. It is guaranteed. It doesn't mean you're on the wrong track. So if you've been praying for something and you feel like you've really been seeking God in a certain area in your life, and you think this is the way that things should go, I'm praying for this person that I know that they would come to know Christ and it seems like they're moving closer to him, but then something happens and they're gone all of a sudden or they're moving a different direction. Don't give up. It's just like that project with your dad. You need to push through those obstacles. That's when you need to start knocking on that door even harder until you get in. Jesus is showing us what a life of prayer is like. And this is actually the life of prayer 
that he himself lived as well. You probably, if you've read the Bible very much, can think of many times when Jesus' life of prayer looked like a wrestling match. Prayer sometimes looks like a wrestling match. Let's read the next verses, and this will be our final point for today that we're coming into. This is immediately after Jesus has taught us about asking, seeking, and knocking. Next, he begins to talk about the Father heart of prayer. Here's what he says. Verse 9. Which of you, if your son, so he's talking to the dads here, notice that. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, here he's recognizing how messed up we all are on the inside. We are. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? How much more will your Father in heaven Give good gifts to those who ask him. Here we see the father heart of prayer. The father heart of God. Jesus' argument goes something like this. Look, you people are really messed up. Okay, we're all in church today and some of us dress nice and wear a tie. Uh, That means we're really good people on the inside, right? No, every human life on the inside is messed up and twisted, every single one. Don't let the outside trick you. We're all here because we're broken people and we need God's help. Would you agree with that? Yes, amen. So he says, you guys, you guys are all messed up on the inside, but almost all of you. Now there are parents who sometimes are abusive to their children, but Jesus is talking in general here. In general, all of you messed up people, me and me too, all of us messed up people, we want to give good things to our kids, don't we? We want to give them the best. We want them to be happy. We want them to have the best kind of life, a better life than we have. And his argument is to try and wake us up from this lie we have believed that God is some mean guy in the sky who hates me and hates my life and doesn't have my best interest in mind. He says, if, if you, if us, if we who are all messed up on the inside, we want to give really good things to our kids, how much more God, who is perfect love, who made every human being, how much is his heart longing dying to give good things to you more than you can possibly imagine. That's how much. Well, why does Jesus need to say this to us? It's because all the people right there, like many of us in this room, no doubt, are remembering that time. You know that time when you prayed and prayed and prayed and asked God for help and he didn't give you the help you wanted. Remember that time, those times when you really needed something and it seemed like God wasn't there for you. You prayed, maybe you worked really, really hard for something, maybe it was even something you thought God had asked you to do and you were pressing into it and asking him for help and you gathered other people to pray and you all sought God together, you worked really, really hard and you ended up with absolutely nothing. Remember what you felt like in that moment. You felt completely destroyed. And then you believed a lie. That's the next thing that happened. You believed that either God doesn't have the power to help you, or he doesn't care. One of those two things. Let's jump back to the beginning. I'm 16 years old. My engine 
has torn itself to pieces. I asked my father for a car. I work crazy hard all summer on this thing that we're doing together, and I end up with absolutely nothing, and I am destroyed. I think my dad doesn't really know what he's doing. He doesn't have the ability to give me a vehicle that will work. Or I think maybe my dad just didn't really care enough to do it properly. Years later, looking back, I realize that all that time had nothing to do with the car, did it? During that time, my whole life changed for the better. I developed character traits that have helped me every single day of my life since, to push through obstacles, to do things that are hard. I gained skills that enabled me to do things I would never have been able to do in life otherwise. But all of that is nothing compared to the greatest thing that I gained. I gained a relationship with my dad that I wouldn't have if it hadn't happened. I realized, actually, even just in preparing this message, I had never realized it. The very next year, my dad bought me a car that worked. What does that mean? He always had the money to buy me a car that worked. Are you kidding me? Why in the world did he buy me two that didn't work? Because he wanted to build a relationship with me. That's why. When I realized that, I was floored. And here's the message for you today in that moment where you believed a lie. God didn't abandon you. God loves you. He has the power to help you. He was trying to build a relationship with you. Yes, he's doing things in the moments when our prayers don't get answered the way we want. He's doing things we don't understand yet. But that does not mean that he doesn't answer prayer. He answers prayer again and again and again. It is the way to get stuff done in this life is with his help and his power. It is the only way to accomplish certain things. There is no other way. The last point for your notes today is this. God wants to give us good gifts. He really is our good, loving father. So your challenge or your experiment that I am going to encourage you to do this week is to pick a situation in your life, a situation in your life that really needs change, and not just ask God for change in that situation, but the experiment is this, I dare you to ask him and then seek him and then knock until the door is open. You, if you do that, you will get an answer. It may not be the one that you want. It often is. But he will answer if you seek him and you knock until the door is open. Like it's your house that you're trying to get into because if you're a follower of Jesus, it is. You will get an answer that will change your life and the world for the better forever. Let's pray as we continue in worship.